All right, so I'm gonna talk about the ohm setting on the meter because it's one of the ones that is underutilized and then when it is utilized, it can sometimes be utilized wrong. So whenever you first look at a meter, if the leads aren't connected to anything, then on this meter, you're gonna get the dashes. On this meter, it reads OL, and that means essentially infinite ohms. So that's not saying no ohms, that's not saying zero ohms, that's saying infinite ohms, which means that if you connect them together, you're gonna to get a very low ohm path, so equivalent to zero ohms, meaning a very good path. Anything in between is going to be a measured amount. We'll just do it on this one here just to show it. So we have an open path, then we connect it together. This one's not set up for the continuity ringer, but you see it's measuring a very low ohm measurement now. So infinite ohms, very low ohms. But how do you imagine it does that measuring? How do you think it does it? Send some electricity. Send some electricity. Yes. Okay. Small charge. Central. Okay. Small charge, potential, yeah, and you're right about that. So I wanna show how we can measure this because it is actually interesting. There are certain limitations to ohm meters and that's because they don't utilize a lot of voltage for their ohm test. It's a pretty low voltage, but you can actually find out what it is. So what we'll do is, I want you to take this meter here and put it to the volt scale. All right, now give me the, give me the meter leads, hold them up to me. And we're gonna measure what voltage we're outputting from the ohm meter on this side. So this ohm meter here is going to output a voltage that's going to be measured on the other side. And let's see what we get. Oh, we need to make sure that we are reading in the DC scale. So right now it's, it's measuring in AC. So change the setting. I think it's the blue button there to get it to go to AC. All right, so what are we, what are we measuring here? Negative 0.8. Negative 0.8 volts. Now that's just because of the polarity. So if I switch it around, 0.8 volts. So that's all we're measuring, 0.8 volts. Not a lot of voltage in order to test that. Now let's flip it around and do it the other way and see how we see how we do. So we're gonna put this one on voltage now, and now we're gonna put this one on the ohm scale. Now again, we're just using the meters we have around here in, this, in the class, nothing super fancy here. Now we need to put this one to volts DC, 0.53 volts, you see that? Very small voltage. Now if we compare that to our fluke, which can put out up to a thousand volts, you can see how with a mega ohm meter, or a ohm meter that puts out a higher voltage, you're going to find shorts with that higher voltage that you're not gonna find with this more simple device. So if you're looking for something like a short to ground on a compressor, these aren't necessarily gonna be your best bet. Now, if they find them, they find them and that's great, but that's why sometimes you're gonna put your meter on ohm scale, you're gonna check for a short to ground, and you're not gonna find anything with a simple multimeter in the ohm scale because it doesn't have that voltage. And that's where a mega ohm meter with a readout comes in really handy. But let's go ahead and show. So we've already shown, this is what it looks like when it's open line, when there's infinite ohms, but let's actually do some measurements with it. We can use our ohm meter for a couple different things. We can look at the opening and closing of switches. So let's say that I couldn't see inside this switch, say the cover was over it, and I wanted to see if it was open. All I would have to do is measure from one side to the other, and I can see that we have an open switch. Now. If the switch makes or closes, now I can see that we have next to zero ohms. So that's for a switch. But for a load, a load is going to have a measured ohm amount. So it's not gonna be open, which is infinite ohms, and it's not gonna be closed, which is near zero ohms. It's gonna be somewhere in between. So now I'm gonna measure across our magnetic coil. So this is our magnetic coil here. One side connects here, the other side connects here. This is just a very simple compressor contactor. These Alligator clips are a little clunky. So now we have both of our meter leads connected to the ohm meter and we're measuring 18 ohms. Now the question becomes, is that good or is it bad? It's hard to know. Unless you had some sort of a rating that told you what the expected ohm rating on this coil would be, it would be hard to know in a vacuum what the ohm rating of this coil should be. Now we know it shouldn't be open and we know it shouldn't be zero, right? But what we could easily do is we could take another one off the truck and compare it to it. Now, if it's a different brand, it might not be exactly the same, but it's gonna be pretty close. So that can give us a really good indication. Let's take a look at a 9340 relay, another really common component in a system. You can see here that it shows an open path from one to three, normally open, and then normally closed from one to two. If this is functioning in its normal state, how it should be, because it's not, doesn't have an energized coil, we should have an open path, infinite ohms from here to here, and a closed path from here to here. 
So let's see what we get. Have an open path where we would expect an open path. We have a closed path where I would expect a closed path. And whenever you're ohming out a switch, that's what you're looking for, open or closed. Another term for that is continuity. When you have continuity, that means there is a path. When you don't have continuity, that means there's no path. Okay, but we're gonna look at the coil again. So here, we've got this, it's covered in you know this white plastic here, but if you look really carefully, you can actually see where the little copper wire runs in and then it connects to these points right here. You can actually see the copper running up through this little channel to both of these connection points. And so these are the points that are the coil. Because the coil is a load, it's going to have a measured resistance. So let's see what we got. Wow. On this, it's auto scaling to 0.4 kilo ohms. So this is measuring at, if we move the decimal over from K ohms, thousands of ohms, we can see that this is actually measuring, what would that be? That would be 416, 414 ohms. Now that seems really high compared to the other coil, but again, we would have to compare this against another 9340, another similar relay, in order to know. So let's grab another one. So we've got one over here at our test board. This is a little older model, so we could have a little bit of variation, but let's just see. This is what we gotta do in real life. Wow, significantly different resistance. Very interesting. Let's try a newer one. 15.7 ohms. So these two are actually pretty close to each other. So do we think we have a bad 9340 right out of the box. Is it possible that that's the case? The next thing to do would be just to energize it and see. Significantly higher. Now again, you can see it is a different brand. This is a Mars, the others I believe are White Rogers. So we'll actually energize it and see if it functions or not with the designed voltage, the 24 volts. Okay, so you can see we have 25 volts. I did not hear the switch click over on this. So this should now be closed and it isn't. This should be open and it isn't because we have an energized 24 volt coil. So sure enough, that coil measured open and it is actually open. I mean, it's not open, but it's measuring very high ohms. So let's go ahead and test it on one of the ones that showed uh, as if it was working and just see if we get a different result. Test to make sure our voltage just went off now. Yep, voltage is off. All right, so we're going to swap this bad boy out with a different one. This is a very surprising demonstration given that I had no clue that that thing was bad when I grabbed it, but that actually makes it that much better. Okay, so now we're gonna apply 24 volts to this coil, the one that measured ohms that were closer to the other. And now I heard it click. That means that this switch that was closed should now be open, and it is. And now this one that was open should now be closed, and it is. Go ahead and hit that switch and watch what happens as soon as we de-energize that coil. Now it goes back to normally open. So that's exactly what it should do. That other one that looks brand new and even threw me off because I was not expecting it to be failed out of the box has a coil that while it's not technically open, it's measuring far higher ohms than it should measure. And that's what's resulting in the issue. This video is gonna turn into a, uh, a comedy of errors. So I pulled this out and actually in, the, in, in one of the views, you probably would have seen it. On this side, you know, this is just the switch ratings, which that's all normal, nothing abnormal there. But here, our coil rating is 120 volts. So of course it didn't pull in with 24 volts. Make sure you pay attention to what you're taking out of the box. The coil is not bad. It's just rated for 120 volts, which is why the resistance of the coil is much higher. When you're comparing apples and oranges, sometimes the measurements don't add up, which is, Kind of a funny thing. But either way, we demonstrated here the opening and closing of a 9340 relay and the measurement of the resistance across it. Another quick thing to mention here is that you never want to me uh, measure resistance in ohms on an energized circuit. And a lot of people will get confused by this because they'll see that I'm energizing the coil and they'll think, well, now it's energized. Well, when you're energizing the coil on a 9340 or on a contactor like this, that doesn't have anything to do with these switch parts. So this, the switches are not connected to this bottom coil part. It's the same thing with the contacts on the contactor. This part here, these lugs are not connected in any way to these. So I can measure with an ohmmeter across the switch portion so long as I'm not connecting it to the coil portion. And that's okay to test, but you never wanna take your ohmmeter in the ohm scale and connect it to an energized circuit 
because you'll damage your meter. So on this one, the coil is actually serviceable and replaceable. It sits in like this, and then these fit on top, and then the base plate goes on like this. Kind of holds it all together, squeezes it all together. But you can see how that portion down there was not connected in any way to the switch portion. But since we're just taking some ohm measurements on some things, let's just keep doing that. So with this, because you have an interchangeable coil, um, I would have to have the coil back out in order to look at it. So let's take that back out again. So here's our coil. It's a little hard to read here, but it says 120 volts at 60 hertz. So this is another 120 volt coil. We can ohm out the coil independently. Now you never want to energize one of these coils without being connected because it will cause it to fail. We can see that this one is 203 ohms. If there's just air inside here, without it actually drawing in, that can cause it to overamp. Same thing is true with the reversing valve solenoid. You only want to energize these when it's actually on its assembly. So now we're going to fit it back together. We're going to be a real pro at this now that I've done it a couple times, I'm sure. I'm a real mechanical whiz. And now we can ohm out the switch. And this is an example where we can't see the switch. We can't see the contacts. So we would check to see, okay, it is open. When we energize it with the 120 volt coil, then we could make sure that the switch actually pulls in and then we would read near zero ohms across the switch. In this case, it's three phase. So we've got three sets of independent switches. All right, let's do some more neat things. We got a float switch here and one kind of fun fact, I did a, I did a Facebook Live video on this once, but on these um, Rector Seal float switches, they come with the conductors actually attached to staples on the outside. So if you want to test the thing when it's on the shelf before you even purchase it, you can actually test on these staples. You normally wouldn't do it with these weird meter leads. All right, so now we're attached there. When the switch is closed, you can hear it beeping. So there we're just using a continuity test to prove that the float switch is actually working. Pretty simple. So it goes from infinite when it's not beeping to continuity, which is a closed switch when it is. Let's check on some heat strips. Now, again, whenever you're measuring on anything where you're trying to test for open, closed, continuity, whatever, you want to disconnect it because otherwise it could backfeed and we don't want to measure a backfeed. We don't want to measure a unintended path that's possibly coming from the other direction. So we're going to measure through one of these strips all the way through and see what we get. So I've disconnected it now. So now there's no way there can be a backfeed and I'm going to measure 11 ohms. Now, a lot of people would assume because this produces a lot of heat that it would be very high resistance, but it's actually the opposite. When you think about Ohm's law, lower resistance equals higher current. And because this is a resistive load, you don't have that additional inductive reactance that shows up in inductive loads. So when you see a low ohm measurement like this, or what is comparatively low, that means it's gonna draw a lot of current. And sure enough, at 240 volts, a five kilowatt heat strip is gonna draw about 20 amps. So what we just measured is a load, a high voltage load. We're looking for a measured resistance. Same thing is true on a reversing valve solenoid. So you shouldn't see completely open, you shouldn't see completely closed because it is a load, it's designed to do work. It's an electromagnet. Let's see what we've got here, 16.3 ohms. Now again, is that good, is it bad? Well, it's not zero, it's not infinite, so that's good. Is that what's appropriate for a reversing valve solenoid? You would have to either have the spec off the solenoid or compare it to another identical model to know for sure. In the grand scheme of things, that looks about like what I would expect for 24 volt, electromagnetic coils, that range is what we seem to be getting a lot of. So I wouldn't suspect that we have a shorted or open. We know we don't have an open, but I wouldn't suspect that that's shorted based on that measurement. Primary and secondary of a transformer. So there's two distinct coils. You have one coil on top, one on the bottom. The one here is your low voltage side, which is your secondary coming out of the transformer. This side is your high voltage going into the transformer. And we have multiple taps here, but mostly what you're looking for when you check a transformer is you want to see that it's not open because when they fail, they're generally going to fail open and you can actually learn a lot by which side failed. If the secondary failed, then likely it's a cause by the secondary. Something is shorted in the secondary that caused the open of the short and the secondary of the transformer. If the primary is what's open, then often it could be a power surge, lightning strike, something that happened on the primary side that caused the transformer to fail. Now on this transformer, you've got to look at it to kind of know what the colors mean. So white is common. And then if we were going to use this on a fan coil, we would use the 240 volt most likely. So we're going to measure between white and orange to see, are we open, shorted, or do we have an appropriate measured reading or what we would think to be an appropriate measured reading. And this is on our primary. This is going in. So we've got 102 ohms going in. If I wanted to know for sure, compare it against another transformer coming off the truck, but it's not shorted. 
and it's not completely open. We have a measured resistance. Secondary, now don't let the beep concern you because we still have a measured resistance. Just because it's beeping, this meter has a point at which it starts giving you that kind of continuity beep. That doesn't necessarily mean it's shorted. You still see we have a measured secondary resistance. So I'm not, I'm not concerned with this. I think this transformer is probably just fine. Chad wired up relay to 120 volts. If we back up here, you can kind of see it's coming directly from our incoming power. Here we go, yeah, right there. 120 volts to the coil, flip the switch. It's amazing how a 120 volt coil relay works best when you <laughs> put 120 volts to it. So there you have it. A lot of different ways you can use an ohm meter and also pay attention to your data tags. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.